Hey, this is Anna from Flexicon, and I want to give you a tour through Disco 1.7. In many ways, we think this is the biggest release of Disco since its original launch two years ago, and we are very excited to show you what's new about it. There are certain trends that we see with our customers. Uh, one of them is a move towards more continuous analysis. For example, if you do a project once, um, and you do an analysis and then you make some changes to the process, you want to verify the effect of those changes. So you want to repeat the analysis. Another scenario is that while maybe the initial project was done by a business analyst, you then want to move more towards the scenario where um, well, the process owner or someone, yeah, responsible for the process um, does certain types of analysis in a continuous way to monitor, to monitor and improve the process further. And a second trend is that there's yeah, more and more bigger data sets that are becoming available. And Disco 1.7 addresses this with three new features, uh, which are airlift, um, recipes and overdrive. And I want to start with overdrive. Um, now overdrive is only going to be relevant actually for a small part of you because yeah, 80 or 90% um, of our Disco users won't notice a difference because Disco has been very fast. Um, uh, always it's highly optimized and for most data sizes, it's uh, very efficient and very powerful. But um, for those of you who are working with very large data sets and this is be starting to become relevant uh, we're talking about a couple of million events at least, um, so that you won't notice any difference. For those of you, this will be very interesting. Well, let's look at what happens if we import a CSV file. So if we import a CSV and we want to get to a process map, um, there's the initial loading and the import of the file, which takes some time. Then afterwards, um, the metrics are built, so certain analysis takes place of the data. And then the last part is the creation of the actual process map, so the disco miner there, that last small little piece. Um, if we're looking at the filtering, what happens there is that the actual filtering takes place and then based on the filter data set, again, the analysis needs to take place and the metrics are built. And then again, the process map is being built. So if you're moving the sliders, that's what you have noticed in Disco. That has always been very fast because actually um, it is only affecting that last small green piece here, which is shown. Um, so yeah, there there's not much to improve on that end. And on the other side, if you're importing the file, so that kind of loading, you only do that once. But where we really see a big potential, um, in, and we, we were thinking about how we could make that faster, is this uh, middle use case here, the filtering, which is what you're doing in an interactive way. Um, and you want to do that in an interactive way also for very large data sets. So this is where um, Overdrive comes in, where um, if you look at the reference point of Disco 1.6, we could already out of the box um, improve that by 30%. So the engine has been more optimized and the, um, the data structures within Disco are very much optimized towards the special data that is needed for process mining. So we could improve that already. But then um, we could improve it even further because what we see is that um, most people today work with standard laptop and desktops which are getting more and more powerful they not only have more and more main memory but they also get um, multiple cpu cores disco now makes use of that and if you for example have a dual core system then in reference to the uh, disco 1.6 performance you don't only get um, a 30 percent improvement but you get a 60 percent improvement and this scales linearly with more cores so if you have very large data sets then you can now level up your hardware to significantly improve the performance that you get and especially yeah if you're working in an interactive setting it can make a big difference if something takes for example 15 minutes or if you can get the same result in one and a half minutes so this really brings it back into that interactive space also for very large data sets and this is Overdrive. The second feature I want to show you is recipes. And recipes is actually one of the most requested features of all times. People told us they wanted to reuse the filter settings. And this is what recipes is about. And if you think about that use case that I mentioned before, it, it makes a lot of sense because 
of this interactive iterative analysis that we do with process mining, we're using filters all the time. We are filtering all the time. So it's very natural to run in situations where you would like to reuse your previous work. And here are just four examples where that might be necessary. For example, you get a new data set, you're doing certain cleanup steps but then you have to go through another data extraction iteration again. So you get the new data and you again have to apply the same cleanup steps. You would like to reuse that work from before. Now, the second one is what we mentioned earlier, that we want to repeat an analysis after we made a process change and we want to see how effective that change was. So we want to apply exactly the same filters than we, that we applied in the first analysis. Or we might want to share a complex filter stack with a colleague. Uh, or if you're a consultant, you would like to leave the work that you did in the project with the client so that they can actually run and rerun certain analysis based on new data in a continuous way. Now, this is exactly what recipe is all about. And you can not only import and export filter stacks, which is, of, of course, um, the first thing that it does, but it does much more than that. It really supports the reuse of filters within Disco in a much more powerful way. For example, you can keep favorites. So you can yeah keep a short list of certain filter combinations that you use all the time, and you can make sure you have them handy every time that you're working with Disco. Um, you can use the history to apply filters uh, in an implicit way. So if you know you were um, using a certain filter a couple of analysis steps back, you can go through the history to find it. And Disco is matching the filters that are available and offering them to you um, in a way that it thinks that, um, that, that the filters are matching uh, your data set in the best way and then once you apply and you transfer those filters to your new data it's making that transfer in the, in the smartest possible way um, to ensure that this is really what you wanted to do. Um, now let me show you how recipes looks like in a small demo. Let's assume we are responsible for purchasing process and we want to analyze that process and um, we want to see how it really runs. So we import the data, we get the process map based on the data. And well, one of the questions that we want to answer in our analysis is um, about the case durations, because we have a certain service level target for this process, which is 21 days. Now, if we look at the, the process here from the discovered process map, we can immediately see that there are incomplete cases in the data. So there are all kinds of uh, weird start and end points that shouldn't be there. So um, one of the first cleanup steps that we want to do is that we want to focus on the completed cases only because otherwise our case duration measurements will be affected by that and we won't get the right um, results. So I can use the shortcut here to place an endpoints filter by focusing only on the cases that are started by create purchase requisition. But then I also only want to focus on the ones that are really running towards the very end, which is pay invoice. So I apply this filter and now I can see from my process map, I'm only looking at the completed cases and I can actually go on with my analysis in the statistics view. I can look at the case duration and well, actually I can see there are just a few cases that are within my expected range of up to 21 days, but there are a lot of cases that take much longer than that like 80 days, 90 days and more. And well, the median case duration is even 88 days. So there's a lot of things that is going wrong here in this process. If I look at the process map, I can see that as well. I can see there's a very dominant rework loop here around this activity, immense request for quotation, um, which happens, yeah, at least almost uh, twice per case on average. And if I go to the performance view and I look at the median durations within the process, I can see, well, not only am I going through this loop very, very often, but if I do that, then it takes, yeah, in, in the medium value is 11 days to get back into the process here. Well, let's now assume that I have identified this problem. I clearly see I have a bottleneck in this process. I go back to my process, I do a change, um, and one month later, I want to see how well this change has actually solved the problem. Did it have the effect that I was hoping for? So I'm getting the new data from from the new process after the change, um, and I import this data. And now 
uh, I'm actually in the same position as before. So again, I actually have incomplete cases in my in my process data here, uh, and I need to add an endpoints filter before I can do the actual analysis. Well, I could go ahead and just manually add those filters again, but with recipes I can now reuse my work um, from the previous analysis, and I want to show you how. So if you go to the filters, which you always get through to this little filter symbol here in the lower left corner, then you will now find the recipe symbols the symbol here. And if you click on that, there are a number of options that you get. And one of them um, is the project view on the recipes, where you see all the filters that are currently applied to other data sets in your project. Well, at the moment, I only have one other um, data set in my project, which is the, the previous purchasing process. And I can see here on the right hand side, I see a filter summary. So like a human readable summary of which filters um, have been applied to the, this particular data set. And what I can see is there's one endpoints filter, um, which focuses on all cases that start with create purchase requisition and that end with pay invoice for activity. This is exactly what I want. So instead of manually configuring this filter, I'm just going to apply that filter from this other project and from this other data set in my project. And once I do that, I can see that the endpoints filter has been added um, in the right configuration and I can simply apply it. And then I immediately get to the right process view that I need for my analysis. And I'm still, look, I'm still um, not in the old analysis, but I'm in the new data that I imported now after the process change, so I can look at the statistics now to see, well, what are the changes? Um, did they have an effect or not? So if I look at the case duration, for example, I see there's indeed now the majority of the cases are taking place within 18, um, 17, 18 days, so within the 21 day limit, and there are only very few outliers. Um, also, the median duration has has been going down from 88 days to 12 days. So there's a significant improvement here. If I look to the process map, I can also see some improvements. It's not going twice through this loop anymore as before. There is still some rework, so I'm still going quite often through this loop. But if I do that, um, let's look at the performance. Well, actually, even if I'm going through this loop, still at least yeah, half as often as before, but still quite often, then it doesn't take that long anymore. It doesn't take 12 days anymore to get back into the normal process, but just 21 hours. So it doesn't have that much of a delaying impact. Well, this shows you how you can use recipes to repeat analysis and to reapply filters that you have previously applied. Now let's look at another example to see how we can use some more functionality around the recipes to make, make our lives easier. Well, I'm importing another data set here to show this. It's a refund process. Uh, it's a customer service process uh, where I have different channels. So I have an extra attribute that distinguishes the channel through which the refund came in. Um, and I'm interested in analyzing the process for these different channels. Now, once I've imported the data, actually I also have a cleanup step to do here because there, I can see there are multiple endpoints, um, they're in complete cases. I actually want to focus on the ones that reach the order completed step. So I'm going to add an endpoint filter here, but then I want to go further because I want to look at the process for the different channels and I'm going to add an attribute filter to focus on a channel attribute and in this case on the call center channel. So what I'm doing is I'm making a copy now and I say, well, um, this is the call center channel process. And once I've created that, I can look at the process now, I can analyze it further um, and see how that particular channel process runs like. Now, let's assume that I want to share this with a colleague of mine who's working with the same data set and they want to get to the same result. Well, I could tell them um, exactly how they could get to the same result by telling them they should first use uh, the endpoints filter with these and these um, settings. And then I give instructions that afterwards they add an attribute filter and so on. But instead of doing that, I can also explicitly share my filter settings with them to make it much easier. So let me show you how that works. I'll again go to the recipes 
and there you find uh, a current tab uh, which holds um, well shows me which filters I have applied to my current data set. So here I can find the endpoint filter that I added and the attribute filter and I can now simply use the export button here to export this filter combination as a recipe file. Um, I'll store it on the desktop and then afterwards I could send it off for example per email and send it over to my colleague. Now let's assume that um, yeah we are now my colleague who is receiving that particular uh, recipe file. So we have not applied those filters yet. Let me clear the filter stack here. We have um, the raw data that we just imported and we would like to get to the same result. So once they have received our recipe file, um, they can go to the recipes here and they can press this load button in which um, they can locate the file after downloading it uh, from the email and then they can open it and they see a preview of well, how the filters in the rest in this particular recipe look like and they can apply it and once it's applied these two filters are applied to the data exactly as they were applied in my case before and i can simply um, confirm this and i'm back exactly to that particular view on the process completed cases for the call center channel only well in this way um, what we've seen so far you can um, reuse uh, data sets, um, uh, filters from from existing data sets. You can explicitly share certain combinations of filters uh, through a recipe file and you can import and load them again later on. But if you're thinking that now you will start collecting and saving a lot of filter combinations in recipe files, I can tell you that's actually not necessary, at least um, as long as you stay working within Disco. Um, I can show you a much more powerful way to do that. So if I go back to the recipes, then um, next to the to the actual um, yeah project file and the the current tab, um, there is actually also a way to make favorites. And favorites are basically a, sh a short list of filters that you really like a lot and that you would like to use and reuse again and again. So for example, if I foresee that I would like to use this particular call center call center channel a filter combination more often, I could make it a favorite by simply selecting it here and then pressing the favorite uh, symbol. So once I favorited it, it will show up in the favorites tab here where all the um, the, the recipes um, that are favorite are listed. And so that's my shortlist where I can always go to if, I, if I'm looking for a certain filter combination um, and I, I, I have saved it there. So that's a great way uh, to keep a reference to the, to the filters you're using very frequently. Well, one thing um, you, you'll be noticing here is that there is actually um, some indication that helps you to see well how good of a fit um, a recipe actually is for your current data set. So there is this star based ranking that you see um, here. For example, if you have five stars, there's only uh, there's zero stars. So apparently this filter combination is a much better fit for my current data set than is one of those uh, other two here, which are favorites that I stored previously. And it makes a lot of sense because for example here, um, that is the filter where I, um, yeah, I filter for a specific attribute that is not even present in my current data. So Disco can see that this is probably not a very suitable filter combination for your current data set and gives you that feedback through the star based ranking. Um, we have the same feedback uh, in the project view. For example, if I go back here, we have been there before, I can see all the filters that are available in my current project, so all the data sets that I have there. And I can see that the purchasing process where I compared the, the old and the new process earlier, that also doesn't have a good fit for my current data, which is no surprise, but the, the call center channel um, um, yeah, filter that I have there, of course, is, is a filter that I have created based on the data set. So it's a very good fit. Now, next to the favorites and the project view, there's also another way um, to find back a filter combination that you used earlier. Maybe you didn't favorite it, but some you know that some analysis steps back, you were actually doing a certain filter step that you would like to repeat again. And to do that, you can go to the history. So also here you get a um, an indication uh, of how, how well of a match the recipe is for your current data, but you basically find now um, over the history, the, the filters that you applied to the different 
data sets across your different projects. So you can simply go back and find something that you did earlier. For example, let's say um, we want to reuse that filter here where we were focusing on the internet channel. So right now we are focusing on the call center channel, but let's say we also want to analyze the internet channel. Now we want to reuse this particular um, recipe here. So I can do that by simply again pressing, pressing apply. And in this case, I would make copy and I could say, well, internet channel. And now I've reused that previous filter um, by selecting it from the history where I was looking back a couple of steps that I did before. Now, um, the last thing I want to show you in the recipes part is that, um, especially based on that star-based ranking that I showed you, um, there's also a way to only see those recipes that are matching your data best. And this is what the matches tab provides. It provides you a view across all the favorites, across the history and the current project data sets, but it only filters for those that are matching, have a good, um, have a good match uh, value for your current data. So all the ones that are not a good match are hidden here. So that's a great way, uh, like the magical view of the, yeah, the most relevant filters for your current data set, which uh, typically gives you like uh, the best uh, reference to find what you're looking for. Well, I hope this gives an overview about recipes. We are very excited about it. We are very curious to hear what you think about it. So let us know. Now, the third feature I want to show you is Airlift. And Airlift is about how to get data into Disco in the first place. Well, the current and also the most flexible way to get data into any post mining tool is the, the CSV or file-based import. And well, Disco imports a couple of formats as shown here, but um, especially the CSV import is the, 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 the most flexible and best way to get data into Disco from any kind of system because you can export CSV from, from any system. Um, and in fact, we've been complimented a lot about the CSV import in Disco because it's very intuitive, very usable, you can um, configure the timestamp patterns and so on. So a lot of the pains that um, yeah you normally have with dealing with uh, and importing files, Disco takes away already. But especially if we're talking about this more continuous use case where I'm repeatedly analyzing the same process again, um, or if I'm moving more towards even more business users that may not even know that much about what process mining is about, there are a couple of challenges. And all these challenges are, for example, that if I'm talking um, about one of those business users um, who don't know anything about process mining, well, the, the import um, of the CSV can become a challenge because to configure um, the file that you are importing, um, you need to assign uh, a column as a case ID, you need to configure your activity name, your timestamp. So what that means is that basically you have to understand what yeah, the, the meta model that underlies process mining as a technology, you have to understand that before you even get started. So in a way, you could say the most difficult part of Disco is that import step, which happens right at the beginning, which well, can be quite a barrier for some people to get started. So if there was a way to take that away, that would be great, right? Um, well, a second challenge is especially in that repeated use case where you're continuously analyzing maybe every week or every month the same process again. Well, in that case, you need to organize the files that you get. You need to have some kind of versioning scheme, not to get confused. If you're working with colleagues on that process, then you need to make sure everyone has the same version and is working on the right version. So there, that can be challenging. And if you're coming from the IT perspective, then that's your job and your role. You need to make sure that people, um, yeah, that you, you provide the right files to those um, yeah, analysts um, and, and business users all the time. So um, this is exactly what is addressed by Airlift, which is since Disco 1.7, now an alternative way to get data into Disco. It's not replacing the CSV import. The CSV import will always be around. And we think that a lot of our users will actually remain um, using the CSV import for most of their, 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 their data sets. But in the continuous use case, um, and if you yeah, want to move your analysis more towards the, the business users in your organization, Airlift provides a very powerful way to have a seamless integration of this actual source data into Disco. Well, this means 
that if you're working with multiple people on the same process that everyone has the right um, like the true reference point right from the data that means that you can get fresh data anytime you want to you say well now I want to analyze the past week or the past month you get it right there from directly from the server so um, there are a lot of advantages and I'll, I'll show you in a, in, in a moment how it looks like now you may be wondering how you can get data into Airlift in the first place. And there are two main scenarios. The first one is if you're a customer of ours and you would like to connect one of your systems to your Disco users through the Airlift integration, then we can help you with that. But there are also official partners. And official partners means that these partners support Airlift right in their products. So they have built this Airlift integration into their products so that they support process mining with Disco out of the box. You don't have to do anything about it. And there are a couple of people integrating their products right now, but we're particularly excited about our launching partners who support Airlift integration today as we speak. And these launching partners are Alfresco with their um, Activity Enterprise BPM system, one of the most popular BPM systems that's around. The second launching partner is Transfer. Transfer provides um, integration, live integration into SAP systems for you. And the third partner is UX Suite. And UX Suite is specialized in data collection. Um, they instrument um, embedded systems, but also websites and make it possible then um, for you to analyze, for example, customer journeys on websites in a, in a very easy way. You will hear much more about these launching partners in the coming days. We will um, yeah, show you in detail how the integration works and what the benefits are of using these products together. But for now, let's take a first look at Airlift in a demo. Now, the typical way to import data into Disco right now is through the CSV import. So, for example, if I import the purchasing process that we were looking at before, the first thing I get is an import screen where I can then um, yeah, assign what column uh, should be the activity name or which column is the, the case ID, the timestamps and well then I can start the import. So this is rather easy to do but at the same time I really need to know the format of the data uh, and I need to know which column my case ID um, is and should be configured. So um, with Disco 1.7, there's an additional option to directly get the data through Airlift. And well, so you get this, um, this option here next to open file, uh, you can say connect to server, where you can connect to the Airlift server. And the first time you do that, you provide uh, the URL of the server and your login details. But afterwards, Disco is remembering this and is not asking you uh, to provide that every time. Well, once we've connected to the server, we get an overview about the processes and the data sets that are available on the server. So here we are looking at a server from Transfer uh, and they are providing live integration into SAP systems. So we have two end-to-end -end SAP processes here that can be analyzed, order to cash and procure to pay. And well, let's say we choose the procure to pay process and we want to analyze um, yeah, the, the, the process up to now, but we want to get just the most recent data. So let's say uh, we limit the time frame here to starting from 2003. Um, so let's say really 1st of January 2003. We can make it really specific. Um, and then we say, well, that's exactly the time frame that we want for that procure to pay process up to now. And well, once we press the download button, the data is directly accessed and retrieved live from that server and this is absolutely seamless and as, as you have seen absolutely non-technical so it's very easy to do for anyone who's working with that process just to request and get fresh data from the server right now whenever they want to analyze it um, and starting from here you have the full powers of process mining that you have with disco the interactive way to drill down uh, to an answer all the questions that you have without any assumptions about the process um, so for example Let's say we're looking at the performance perspective here for that procure to pay process. Uh, we want to look at the median duration and actually, um, of course, we can make use of um, recipes as well. For example, we have done a previous analysis um, before where we were looking um, at the data until 2002 and we were seeing that there was a particular bottleneck um, between the create purchase requisition and create purchase order requisition a step which was taking particularly long. So if we want to reuse um, these filter settings for our new fresh data that we just 
um, yeah, requested through the airlift integration, then of course we can we can do that. Uh, for example, here through the project view by applying the filters, um, and yeah, we're right where we want to be and can get started directly with the analysis. And we see that actually it hasn't improved, but it has gotten worse. Well, so what you can see is really that through this airlift integration, we can choose the process that we want in an absolutely non-technical way. We don't have to know anything about the format and the particular configuration of the data. We just say which process we want, we specify the time frame that we want it for, and then we download and analyze it directly from the server. So we can get fresh data whenever we need it for the continuous use case, and we can really connect business users who are responsible for that process, who want to know what's going on, um, who get the full power of process mining without the complexities that are involved with setting up the data in the first place. Well, um, I hope this gives you an overview about Airlift. Now, to complete this demo, we want to quickly show you three more things that come with Disco 1.7 that we think you will like as well. And to do that, I'm going back to one of the, um, the previous data sets that we were analyzing. Well, the first um, feature is filter summaries. And well, when you filter with Disco, you can combine different filters, you focus your analysts uh, analysis on a specific aspect and you always get this little indicator here in the lower left corner, uh, corner that tells you how many cases and how many events are covered by your current selection. So here for example we see that about 31% of the cases from the overall data set are covered by my current filter set. Well um, with filter summaries now you can simply click on that um, pie chart and you get um, in a summary overview in a, in a human readable way that shows you what kind of filters you have applied and how they're configured. So this way you don't have to go directly to the filter settings to look at them in detail. So for example, here we see we have an endpoint filter applied uh, where we filter on one specific start and end activity. If we go to another data set, the one we just saw from the, um, from the procure to pay process, um, then we see that there are actually two filters applied as we have a performance filter that focuses on long-running cases that are yeah, running longer than two days and we also have an endpoint filter applied. So um, yeah, that's that's a quick way to, 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 to glance at what kind of filters you have applied to make sure you have the right ones or just to remind yourself what you're looking at. Um, so we, we, we think you will find that very handy. The second thing I want to show you is um, uh, secondary metrics and well in Disco actually we deliberately uh, chose to show you one metric per view in the process map because this way you can choose the view that you want to look at and then you can immerse yourself in the analysis and um, yeah the the kind of metric you're looking at goes into the context and in the background so it's not um, it's not in the cognitive load that you have and you have more resources available to do the analysis itself. Um, for example here we're looking at the absolute frequency uh, which shows really every um, loop that we're taking here in that process but if we wanted to take another perspective we might want to see well, how many cases are actually going through certain parts in the process and to the activities um, yeah, ignoring that some of the cases might go certain rounds multiple times so if we do that then we get a different view that now allows us to answer different questions about the process so we see for example that out of the 57 that are started here 36 uh, cases go through this extra loop so having one metric in the picture um, of your process map is a conscious choice and is one of the reasons why Disco maps are so great to read and so easy easy to read and to understand. Um, at the same time, there can be situations where you actually would like to have like a secondary metric, some other, other metric also in the picture. Um, for example, if you're looking at the performance um, metrics, there is the total duration, which is really... Um, a great metric because it shows you the um, where the high impact areas are in your process. It takes into account the actual delays but also the frequencies. So it really shows you in one glance cumulatively over your whole data set where um, most of the time is lost between activities but also yeah in activities. And um, if you if you do that you can very quickly see where your bottlenecks are but once uh, you are there you yeah you actually would like to know more about well what um yeah uh, what kind of medium or mean duration for example is it 
um, how long does it take to go from that step to that step. The 46 months are cumulatively over all the cases. Um, so it shows me that this is the biggest bottleneck. So that's also why this is really red and very um, yeah, highlighted for me. But now um, yeah, I might actually want to look at the median duration. And I see, well, on average, it takes 11 days. Um, well, uh, I can easily do that switching back and forth. Um, I can also click on that arrow to see well all the metrics in one picture for that particular um, yeah connection or that particular activity. I can do the same. Um, but for example, if you would like to export um, yeah your process map uh, with both the median duration and the total duration to share it with um, yeah, one of your colleagues, then uh, you can now do that with secondary metrics. So for example, I have the total duration here, which gives me the highlighting and, um, um, and everything, but then I can add as a secondary metric, for example, the median. Um, and in this way, I'll still have the focus present. You see the, the whole um, yeah, process map becomes a little bit more information dense, but in this case, uh, I might want um, to do that um, and then I still see well this is the the bottleneck but now I can not only see the cumulative times but also the um, the median duration here in smaller font size and also in smaller font size and in brackets within the activity for the activity durations so um, yeah so with uh, the process maps you now have the option if you want to uh, to add a secondary metric and the third thing that I want to show you is that uh, with all the metrics that you get in the process map um, you can now also export them um, to um, yeah, Excel so normally you would export a process map as a PDF but sometimes um, yeah, people really like that they actually can export anything that you do all the statistics everything can be exported as a CSV file to Excel to do some custom analysis uh, if needed and now you can do the same with the process map so there's this additional option here metrics um, and CSV and zip where you get all the metrics uh, that you get in the in disco for your analysis but you can uh, get them in a format that you can use to do custom calculations in Excel if you if you need that well thanks a lot for watching this uh, this tour, we are very excited about Disco 1.7. We hope you like it um, and let us know what you think.